Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey folks, it's Shay here, and I am excited to be back for another episode. Today, I am talking with Marty Ropp, who is with Allied Genetic Resources. And so Marty and Allied Genetic Resources, that is a company that offers a multitude of products and services for cattle producers, whether you a whether you are a commercial producer, a seed stock producer, there is something that this company can do to help you. And so we will be talking about the different services they provide today. And before we dive into that, I want to let you know that if you are listening to this episode right as it comes out in early October, there is still time for you to register for the quarter four Rancher Mind event. So Rancher Minds are mastermind events for ranchers. So these are Q&A discussions between industry experts and cattle producers such as yourself. And so these conversations in October, November, and December will be entirely focused on business management with the goal of helping you run your business better. Um, So whether it's cleaning up finances, leading meetings, strategic planning, finding alternative revenue sources um, or alternative funding options, we're going to talk about it. So head to my website and you can register there or you can also send me an email and we can figure out what the best option for you is and help you get involved. So the website is in the show notes. That's casualcattleconversations.com. But with that, let's visit with Marty. Well, Marty, it's great to have you on the show today. I know I get to run into you at different conventions and whatnot, but uh, it's always nice to take those faces that I see at conventions and have them on the podcast too. So to get started, would you kind of share with the listeners what your background in the beef industry is so that they get a better idea of who you are and what you've done? Okay, I'll do, I can do that, Shay. Matter of fact, I'm going to back up even just a little bit farther. Um, I kind of cut my teeth in this business, in this pig genetics business, uh, starting back in the seventies. And, um, most folks that know me know the story, but got to watch that business change, um, and, um, evolve into something completely different, uh, than what we were used to or uh, were comfortable with. And, uh, so I jumped to the beef genetics business. Uh, I believe it was in January of 98, um, Actually, actually, December of 98, January of 99, which for those of you that happened to be in the pig business during that time uh, was the worst time in history uh, for the pig business. And so uh, not really on purpose, but uh, fortuitously, I uh, made my, my leap into that in 98, um, spent 12 years at American Scimitol and now almost 14 years uh, managing Allied. So before we kind of dive into what Allied Genetic Resources does, because you're a big picture thinker. I want to get your perspective on this early. So where do you see the beef industry in 20 years? And actually some of my favorite people to ask this are the people on the show who have gone from like pigs to beef, because there's, there's always a unique perspective there. So where do you see the industry in 20 years? I mean, that's, we talk a lot about that. And um, I even, um, with the folks that work with me who are all younger than I am, um, I think the closest one's about, you know, maybe 10 years younger. Um, but we talk a lot about that because it's something that uh, that I spent a lot of time thinking about as I was, you know, kind of growing and developing the ideas for Allied, even when I was working uh, with a breed association or or prior to that. Uh, because everything in agriculture is a is a long picture window, or at least has been in the past. Um, families move on to new generations, grow businesses, some come, some go. But uh, folks that aren't thinking that far ahead uh, probably are are doomed to you know, repeat negative things from the past or poor decisions from the past and ultimately not um, continue to participate way out into the future. Uh, that being said, you know, we've, there's been a lot of predictions. People are always predicting, well, this is going to be in five years, everybody will be doing this or five years, everybody will be doing that. And um, the beef business is one of the most slow um, industries to evolve in that way. And part of the reason obviously is because of the land base, land base and the number of producers and all those kind of things. But um, as I look 20 years down the road, uh, I, I, I'm always, and I'm, I've always thought this way, logical things happen. So if you see things that are illogical that are happening, uh, it's because someone's being paid. 
<laughs> to, <laughs> someone's being paid. And that's the reason, at least for the short period of time, the illogical things happen. But in the long term, um, those things take care of themselves uh, because illogical systems and illogical um, reasons for doing business, don't, they don't last um, because ultimately they go back to fundamentals. And um one of the things, you know, as you look out 20 years, uh, there's always going to be important things at the farm and ranch level. Uh, the ownership and control of land and how that affects the beef business will always be important. Um, um, you know, things are going to change marketing wise, labor wise, systems wise. Uh, but the, the core things, you know, somebody has to raise the cows, somebody has to do the work, somebody has to deliver the product and the product has to be phenomenal. Um, but for what we're for what we're asking for that product today and what we're hoping to be asked for that product 20 years from now, um, it has to be exceptional. It can't be it cannot become generic crackers. It's got to be an exceptional product to command that kind of premium. So keeping those things in mind, you know, pushing on costs at the ranch level and pushing on value at the end product level. Um, those are logical things. And I think that's I think those are the things we have to keep focused on. And that seems simple. Uh, but uh, there's a lot more to it than that. Well, and as beef producers, we know that there is a lot to that. And as people, sometimes we do like to chase shiny objects too. So it's good to stay centered on what matters most. I think, I think one other piece, and I've, I've mentioned this a lot of times in presentations and whatever, is that uh, because of the nature of the time um, component, particularly of a genetics business, but I mean, all parts of it too, I suppose, all parts of beef business. But you know, when you buy bulls in 2023, um, breed cows in 23, have calves in 24, in 26, uh, 2026, the first daughters of those bulls have their first calves. And in 2036, they're 10 year old cows. And if they, if the bulls breed cows for five years or so, like they should on the average, I mean, it's like 2041, your 10 year old cows will be sired by the bulls you purchased this year. Uh, and the seed stock business backing up a generation or two behind that uh, just shows the nature of of the urgency uh, for making genetic improvement and that uh, it takes in order to even have an impact five or 10 years from now. So I think that's another another reason why we look out 10 and 20 years to try to make decisions. Absolutely. So, you know, you kind of led into that with the importance of genetic improvement a little bit. So what is Allied Genetic Resources? You said that started 14 years ago? Uh, 2010. So this is our 14th year of operations. Um, Allied Genetic Resources was a concept actually I'd been thinking about for many, many years prior to that. Uh, but it was a plan to be able to provide uh, greater services all the way down chain, uh, beginning with the, the building blocks of, of, uh, of how we make those improvements, and that is making genetic improvement. Uh, for trades that are important and and not just fad trades, but trades that are going to affect value and and costs long into the future. Uh, so we start at the genetic level by um, providing technologies and support to make you know maximum or at least optimum genetic improvement uh, for economically important trades. And then uh, because we believe that that uh, that when you get what you select for, uh, we also know those products are worth more as we move down chain through commercial cattle production. Um, the uh, feedlot and packing and uh, beef business. And so we try to push that farther forward, um, generating um, commit or using commitment to help generate income for all, all uh, segments of the beef business, starting with genetics. And um, there's only two things that the genetic providers offer to their customers. One is hopefully, and uh, necessarily it has to be, they have to offer genetic improvement. The, the other thing they have to offer is service. And those two, if you, Think about all the things that your seed stock can provider does for you. Everything can be lumped into one of those two piles. And so uh, both are necessary and we help on the service level, but we also help at the technology and genetic improvement level. So how did your experience in the swine industry help you start this business in the beef industry? That's that is a that's a very core good and core question because it was it's the reason I started the business. Um, in nineteen, I started in the pig genetics business in nineteen seventy four, which dates me pretty close. But uh, I was not very old then. And uh, at that point, the pig genetics business was very traditional. 
it was uh, farmer to farmer, selling boars, not a lot of technology, a lot of conversation about what a great boar looks like or doesn't look like, big, little, fat, skinny, whatever it was for years and years. And um, the pig business began to grow. And the, the traditional seed stock business was not willing to accommodate the changes uh, that were happening in the commercial uh, business. And therefore, because of that, and logically so, almost everyone that I knew and worked with in the pig business and grew up with and believed had magic beans and did things right and and uh, were successful, almost everyone I knew, um, if they're fortunate, they sold out. If they weren't fortunate, they went bankrupt uh, because they were, they were not going to change. They were not going to adjust. Uh, this is the way it was and should be. And that was that was painful for someone who you know the you know the people that you were your mentors and people you looked up to, mm -hmm. watching one after another um, you know, lose their businesses. And so when I moved over to the beef business, I said I'm not interested in that happening uh, because I believe there are adjustments that could have been made through the 80s and 90s to the genetics business that could have uh, at least delayed those changes and help people be help more people be successful longer. Uh, versus the uh, kind of just uh, brick wall kind of changes uh, that happen in the pig business, and I believe if your if your customer base and your um, you know the people you work with that are that are profit focused, um, if they make if you make small changes over time, um, that's possible. Um, abrupt changes are difficult, and so Allied was designed to help producers make small changes over time and stay ahead of systems. And uh, that's what we still do today. So when we look at the pig business, it's much more vertically integrated than the beef business right now. And you're talking about how you're looking at your past experiences with swine and how you don't want that, don't want to see that in the beef industry. Do you think that the beef industry is a little more safeguarded because we're not as vert vertically integrated or what do you kind of, what is, what's your take on that? Yeah, that, that's that is the logical question, and um, I think the answer is that logical things happen. <laughs> I'll go back to my original statement: uh, the pig business became vertically integrated to reduce cost and uh, increase uniformity and value of product, increase the size of systems because large systems that are profitable are hard to compete against for small systems that are profitable. And so, again, it, as you look at that, you can. You can design ways to make yourself more, to make your business more robust, more competitive. But ultimately, uh, in the end, those that are more profitable will grow, and those that are less profitable will not. And so, you, know, you have to you have to think from a vertical coordination perspective, because your customer matters. And that was one of the one of the fallacies in the pig business was that the people that were raising pigs said, "You're going to buy these pigs and and sell them as pork." regardless of what we do. And systems said, no, we have, we have desires for products that fit our systems and we can make more money with. And um, so the, the inability or unwillingness to change ultimately was illogical uh, and caused problems. And the beef business, I mean, if, if you don't look around now and see more vertical coordination happening around you, you're not paying much attention. Um, and part of that is because, again, there's a desire from end users for more value, more uniformity, uh, and more coordination to take out some of the take to take some of the dollars out of the system that are currently loose and slack. Um, if, we're, if we're not careful, we can let some of those uh, carrots, uh, some of those value carrots uh, from an income standpoint, uh, cause us issues at the ranch level. But um, oh, because they're you know those are all I mean 100% output and no input in, included in those decisions. But um, ultimately, the person that writes your check helps make a lot of decisions for you. And so if that's a system, uh, then you become part of that system or uh, you find someone else to write your check. So I want to go back to something that you said a question or two ago in one of your answers. And you said that Allied was designed to help producers make small changes because big changes can be hard to overcome and adapt to. So what are some of those small changes that are making a big difference that you're helping producers make? whether that's through your services or products, but what are some of those small changes you're helping producers with? Sure. One of, one of the things that we work with, and this is a little more abstract, but um, a group 
a group of producers, in this case, one the size of Allied, uh, can begin to interface business at a level that's different than an independent. Uh, even though everyone wants to maintain their independence, and that's an important part of what we do, because again, that change piece that you're talking about, um, changing as an independent person um, is more difficult than if you see the people around you making adjustments and you you, know, you begin to work with them. Uh, because over the number of seed stock cows and bulls in the system, a small change has a large impact. And so th those are, I mean, that's kind of the thought process behind it. We offer um, some some precision mating tools now through Dr. Sachi and Top Genomics that are, that are moving the needle. Uh, we encourage uh, value creation all the way back to the genetic side by, with tools like that, but also the traditional tools. And that's because as we help people market bulls and we help their customers market feeder cattle, the ones that are worth more bring more. And so that positive reinforcement is, an, is a simple way to help encourage change. Um, you know, bigger, a bigger carrot, you run harder for a bigger carrot uh, versus the old kind of thought process is, you know, these are my customers. They're going to buy seed stock from me forever because uh, that's my brother-in-law. And uh, that process is not, it's not going to work anymore. And so we need to, you know, encourage change, encourage more communication between seed stock providers uh, and their commercial customers, encourage a little more coordination in the way the cattle are marketed, feeder cattle are marketed, so that they can take advantage of uh, process and superior genetics. All, all those are pieces of what we do. We even have a, uh, a data business that works under us that helps people keep a better track of what they do at the ranch level uh, through Data Genie. And uh, so we try to do all these different components and put them together in a system that just helps, again, drive positive, sustainable change for the better. So would you talk a little bit about like the structure of Allied? You alluded to it as you, you talked about a group of producers, but can you talk a little bit about the structure of the business itself? Sure. Um, it was it was created as a member owned LLC again in 2010, the original business, Allied Genetic Resources. It was about 65 seed stock providers. Uh, that came in as owner, as member owners of that business. Now that number is up closer to 100. But um, that is the general service business. Uh, we do marketing management. We do lots of consulting. We purchase lots of seed stock. Uh, the feeder calf marketing business is through there. Uh, Dr. Sachi's genomic products business is through the original Allied business. Um, so that was that was the core business, and it works. We have a um, Julie Mernon does all of our publishing work. I mean, we even go so far as you know, keeping track of, of some of the traditional things and trying to do the traditional things better, even as we work on changing things, you know, coming up toward the future. Um, after that, uh, we started the, um, the all beef business in response to some of the genetic ownership change pieces that we see across the industry. Uh, that is, uh, um, we own in partnership uh, with with seed stock providers, we own superior genetics or own parts of them so that we can be more involved in the beef business, you know, farther and farther down chain and even farther into the future. Um, that business is um, stud bulls and donor females to help, again, encourage maximum genetic progress and also help our producers um, be able to make those changes while taking a little less risk. Uh, not in, not encompassing, not, not taking on all the risk it takes to make that kind of um, that kind of increase in speed, uh, but uh, some of it still have to, everybody takes some risk. Uh, the third business is Allied Feeding Partners, uh, which is about four, almost five years old now, and that is a that's we we buy feeder cattle from our members owners and and feed those cattle and uh, through commercial feed yards and sell them into systems so that we can work farther down chain. And so that we can begin to show benchmarking information, this is what better, this is what better cattle, better genetics and better process is worth. And so encourage, again, encouraging to do the right things, encouraging positive change uh, by uh, creating additional markets. And uh, Clint Berry runs the Allied Feeding Partners business, but there's about 16 or 18 owners in that business, including myself. So that's about, all, in all told, there's about 100 member owners now between the three businesses. And um, we're in 24 states. Uh, those those owners market about somewhere between 10 and 11,000 bulls a year. And uh, we try to help them tie tie their businesses together so that it's seen more as a as a you know a, a larger, more robust uh, kind of a population. 
and then uh, we try to tie their their um, commercial customers and even industry customers down t- down chain together as a larger group and, and help them uh, with customer recruitment and retention because they sell a better product and they offer more services. So that's, I mean, that's the business in a nutshell. So as you're tying these different pieces together, what are your customers seeing? I mean, like what are, what benefits are seed stock producers seeing? And then what benefits are their commercial customers seeing? Um, and, and again, that varies a little bit. Uh, but I'll tell you that uh, we sell substantially more bulls for substantially more money um, than what we did at the onset of the business. Um, the uh, you know the average price of commercial bulls at those herds that utilize lots of services, including um, including some of the marketing services and all we we help their customers with, those cus- those customers are enjoying a substantial amount of success. And because of that, I, I feel like more sustainability long-term as they build closer relationships with those customers and even closer relationships with the customers of those customers as you, as you look down chain. Um, so that's been a real positive, a real positive piece of, of what's happened. We continue to grow, uh, continues to be more interested in our business every year, because I think this model of make a better product, and then uh, help your customers make more money with that product is the only, that's the only model that's sustainable long-term versus, hey, buy my, buy my bulls are the greatest bulls in the world, which uh, I think that model, even though they're still some function that way, I don't see much future in that. So what was the biggest disconnect you saw between seed stock producers and their commercial producers when they were marketing was it that hey buy my bull he's the best bull in the world or what what did you kind of see there when you first started helping seed stock producers connect with their commercial producers there is some of that there's some and there's a tradition of um you know your your uh, you know, your mom and dad bought bulls from me and you know i expect you to buy bulls from me too and you know that that built-in tradition that that was there for a long time um was really not very it was a little illogical um, if you could get a better product somewhere else and more service somewhere else. So well, that was one of the disconnects was was that. And I think, again, as, as we as these genetic choices come with more service, the, you know, the opportunity to retain customers is better. And um, so, I mean, I think that's a that is it's a to, it's a logical way to think about it. But it really was not in a lot of cases um, different than that. I mean, people spent more time trying to decide what breed of cattle to buy. Uh, than they did, you know, studying the the uh, genetic effects of purchasing whatever it was that they purchased, because there's more difference uh, within uh, breed choices or group choices often uh, than there is among um, in, than there is among the breeds. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, thinking about things differently, thinking about them as as uh, the genetic product you're buying versus maybe the breed of bull that you're buying, uh, those things are crucial. Um, taking advantage of of things that are true. Um, and one of the things that's true is that crossbred cows are substantially worth more and more profitable at the ranch level than straight bred cows, uh, regardless of, you know, dogma and advertising again, buy my bull because he's the best. If, if that bull's not providing any, any uh, helping to provide some, some heterosis, if you're keeping replacement females, then he's not the best bull in the world for you. Um, just some of the, you know, some of the old givens, we really, it's, it's hard to work through them, but that's the, you know, that's the case. We don't buy... Uh, for instance, if we sell, you know, a, um, I don't know, pick a breed of bulls. If you sell one out of that breed and, uh, and uh, you know, someone says, well, I bought that bull because he's this breed. Um, if, if you didn't have any more to it than that, uh, then that was, that was not a smart decision. Um, it needs to be from a great source, great genetic value. And then from, you know, from a, whether it's the producer and or the breed it has to have enough reputation that you can market those cattle for as much as they're worth. So I know with your right mate program, you offer some genetic selection tools for seed stock producers. What is available for commercial producers, producers who are on the other end of it and looking to make sound mating decisions to advance their herds. Do you have any services there that you can talk about? We're, we're working on that. Uh, we've actually beta tested that now for a couple of years um, with commercial herds, and we'll be entering into a into a um, relationship with a um, oh, an industry partner that's going to help us deliver that product. A product that'll be called Best Mate, 
and uh, I'm not sure if I can announce the name of that or not, but that should we should be seeing that in September, and we're just really really anxious to get that process started um, because we've done it at a commercial level and it works. Uh, commercial producers can take advantage of precision mating tools just like seed stock producers can, and um, you know the original right mate program and right choice programs are based on you know being very very precise and individual in matings as you'd see in a, at the seed stock level. And again, the commercial producers are different than that. They manage cows differently. Uh, sometimes they, you know, sometimes if they utilize AI and things like that, it becomes a precision tool that, you know, that they can use more like right mate. Uh, but if we're talking about mating groups of females, uh, whether you sort those groups to better mate the bull, better uh, complement the bulls that you have, uh, or whether you replace those bulls uh, with bulls that better complement your cow herd, which however, however that is, those tools are going to be available starting in September. Uh, on large scale, and uh, we're extremely excited about that because, like I said, it's it's worked very, very well uh, working with the commercial producers we've already worked with. Just the increase in uniformity by itself uh, is worth the value of the program, uh, let alone the the genetic advancement, which we we can document that as well. But um, just by by avoiding wasted by having as few wasted matings as you could have, um, it's it really can help push. Uh, you push your product forward and again just from a uniformity standpoint let alone the rest of it um, the successes uh, through dr sachi's programs have been uh, they've been fun to document and extremely good and it's not you, you know you hear about some uh, some other mating programs that just really utilize them just simply use a planned mating uh, which is fine better than nothing uh, but when you can when you can add complementary genomics to that and again avoid those matings that are not going to work or at least not going to work a high percentage of the time, uh, it just changes the way that you the way that you view genetics. What is a wasted mating for a commercial <laughs> producer? A wasted and, and we've we've used that with term before, but it's more a high risk mating. Um, potentially, maybe the sire and dam have got some. Uh, some large effect genes, uh, whether it's from calving ease or growth or carcass traits, that are a problem. Um, they're not, you know, they maybe they're a, maybe they're heterozygote at a single location uh, for a gene that has a huge effect on birth. Um, and therefore, when you when you find a mating, you use a bull uh, that's a heterozygote or even a homozygote the wrong way, um, you have a potential of really creating a problem just by just in that single gene, let alone all the other possibilities of things that are, that are, uh, uh, that are important, but if that the mating should not happen, if that, uh, if that female has a, well, maybe I, now again, I'm not sure if the terminology is right, but she's got one copy of a broken gene. You have to make sure that the bull that she's bred to doesn't have a copy of that gene as well, or you have a potential for a problem. And uh, that thought process as I've been through it now for five years, with the seed stock mating, uh, it, it answers so many questions. Why did this work? Why did I use um, this light birth weight bull and this light birth weight cow and get one that was, you know, get one that was 117 pounds? Why did that happen? And the answer is that even though the most of the genes were very positive for cavities and birth weight um, on both sides, there was one copy of a gene in there that, that added 8, 10, 12 pounds of birth weight to that mating. And uh, that was just like, you know, what, why, did, why did I get a horned calf out of two pulled parents? Um, or why did, um, why did I get a genetic defect, you know, dead calf out of two parents that were perfectly normal? And it's the same reason. Those are just different large effect genes uh, than the genes, the, um, the quantitative large effect genes that we work with. So, so Marty, you're, you know, we talk a lot about the seed stock producers, how you're helping them. Now, from a commercial side, what's your impact on the commercial cow herd today? Oh, obviously, we try to do we try to do things in the old way, where we try to migrate better genetics or more valuable genetics downstream in the commercial business. But we also uh, help commercial cattlemen by helping. Uh, we'll, we'll market 30, 35,000 head of feeder cattle this year from our members, customers, uh, and some other folks. That again, most of those do superior, but not all of them. Uh, we help put buyers with sellers, even on animals that we're not personally representing. Uh, we do a lot of individual consulting with those herds uh, now with right mate, right choice, and uh, and best mate. Um, so we, we you know connect with those producers. We do quite a little bit of educational programming, um, and we also you know we also kind of 
as a process, you know, building through the years, um, trying looking for options for um, putting like kinds of cattle, like minded producers into beneficial financial relationships. Um, we estimate that if, you know, if we sell 11,000 or 10,000 bulls a year, three years of running bulls, um, if those producers purchase half or more of their, of their uh, uh, bulls out of the allied system, uh, there's somewhere between a million and a million and a half commercial cows that are affected um, through the allied genetic system. And if we we're able to um, put together supply chain options uh, that provide greater value for more valuable genetics, which we've got, we've got that first part of it done. Um, we think if we could coordinate 10 or 20 percent of, of that offering, um, it would be a pretty valuable product to the industry. And um that's always been a thought process too, is that, you know, if you can put your money where your mouth is um, and provide value uh, in quantity, then you can take advantage of that. And we think, think our commercial customer base has a chance to do that. And they still have the opportunity to take advantage of heterosis and cost savings at the ranch level. Um, but then to be able to take advantage of, of the, of the growth and carcass genetics and uniformity and value that they've been selecting for, for years by purchasing allied genetics, allied seed stock. That's a lot of cows, Marty. <laughs> it is, but it, it works out. <laughs> you figure 10,000 cows a year, or 10,000 bulls a year, there's about 30,000 running bulls. And if each one of those bulls mates 25 cows, that's three quarters of a million cows. And again, we're not, we're not stupid enough to believe that our customers buy all their bulls from us. So if they buy half of them, that's a million and a half. If they buy two thirds of them, that's just over a million commercial cows. That we have some sort of, you know, we have some sort of contact with, um, and um, who have some, you know, have some similarities from a genomic standpoint, and um, we believe too that you know better better commercial customers from a process standpoint, a selection standpoint, are the ones that are buying those better bulls, and um, and we're we uh, we feel like that population is 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 substantially better. Than, than average. And uh, we have good documentation, good third-party documentation of that. So it's a fun group to work with. Challenging, challenging, uh, talented, and fun group to work with. Have you always been interested in genetics or why did, why did you kind of start down this route as your career path, even in the <laughs> industries? <laughs> yes, I've always been interested in genetics uh, all the way back to when I purchased my first bred yilts in 1973, I don't, I've just had fascination with genetics um, ever since. And um, went to school for that reason, got a master's degree and, and kind of applied genetics because I really wanted to talk to producers about how to manage genetics at the, you know, at the farm and ranch level. And uh, fascinated by the potential for change, fascinated by the, for the um, potential for improvement. And um, so I've been in that, you know, in one form or another since I was, since I was a kid in 4-H. Okay. Well, we're going to, I appreciate you talking about that and I'm going to circle back to allied because we went a little bit down a rabbit hole there, yes. an important one, but we're going to circle back. And you had mentioned that um, you're working with a different industry partner to help commercial cattle producers. Who are other industry partners that you work with, with you, your different products and services? Um, we, again, we, we try to do things to expand the size of our footprint. And so we work with, for instance, we work with all of the major semen companies in one form or another, particularly on the all beef level, but also on the, on the allied level. Um, our semen company is run through origin, through origin, uh, beef and um, origin incorporated at there at, um, um, just South of Billings. Uh, they do all of our distribution and work. Otherwise we couldn't have a semen company. Uh, most of our feeder cattle marketing, though not all of it, certainly um, goes through our team that works uh, through Superior. Um, there's uh, Clint Barry and Rocky Forsyth kind of ma ramp that or manage that team, but there's five or six reps, and they specialize in marketing cattle based on you know, on source of genetics uh, because we know more about those cattle and their value uh, than uh, than the buyers do, and it helps us to to better represent those cattle based on being a more little more uniform um, kind of a group. So um, we do those things. We, when our sale management team, uh, which is Corey Wilkins and Jared Mernon, you know, they work with um, uh, providers of all kinds of services, 
video services, you know, for sales like DV and Superior and live auctions, people like that. Um, they also work with providers to help them with photos and videos and, and uh, printing and all those kind of, all those kind of things. So, you know, we try to, again, we try to keep that, we try to keep that net wide. We work with most of the breed associations um, in, to some extent, particularly now as we've expanded right made and right choice to where we have working relationships with, um, with not only Semitol, but Red Angus, Gelby, uh, Limousine, um, Black Hereford, and now a couple more uh, breeds that I think will come on here in the next, in the next month or so uh, to get access to genotypes so that we can make those help help producers make those precision matings uh, that they need to be able to make if they want to move forward more quickly. So I, I don't know, Neogen, we do a huge amount of work with Neogen. Uh, they're our genomic service providers and they've been just terrific at, at helping us out on that side of things. Their services are extremely professional and their focus on the future is really good. And, and um, so anyway, those are some, I know, I, I know I've left some out, but those are some of the folks that we work with all the time as uh, both as service providers and partners. So if there's a producer out there listening to this podcast and they're wondering, is this business right for me to get involved in? What questions do they need to be asking themselves before they reach out? I think that I think that's a fair question. Um, matter of fact, that was how when I started the business, I designed those questions ahead of time before I talked to the people that, to see if they were interested. Um, they need to have a 10 or 20 year focus on their business. Um, if they're considering not being in the genetics business five years from now, and this being kind of a stopgap, um, that's that's not probably not going to to uh, work for them as well as it could. Um, are they committed to the commercial beef business? Um, the idea of their commercial customers being profitable long out in the future and sustainable long out into the future. Um, if that's not their primary focus, then Allied probably isn't perfect for them. We don't just we don't just sell bulls. Uh, we try to we try to help sell bulls that have immense value to the industry, commercial beef business, and we and and all the way down chain. Um, so those are some things. Are you know are you are you either capable of working um, with by yourself or with a group to maintain a critical mass that it takes to service um, you know, a large number of customers, uh, particularly customers again that are you know focused on selling feeder cattle or retaining ownership or being involved in systems, whatever that is. If those things are your, if that's your core business, then um, then we uh, we are interested in business with you, whether it's for Allied Feeding Partners or all be for Allied, the original parent company. Um, we uh, that's what we, those are the things we focus on. If you focus on those same things, you know, customer high levels of customer service and uh, for recruitment and retention, then um, then you see eye to eye with us. So where can people reach out and learn more? Is that on a website? Is there other information I can include in the show notes? Sure. Um, the easiest way is probably go to the website. It's just uh, alliedgeneticresources.com. And uh, that, that website is is getting a, a facelift currently and uh, should be done here before too long. We, and uh, in addition, there'll be an all beef website that's tied to it, linked to it. And so you can find out more information about all beef and allied feeding partners right there on, um, on the allied genetic resources.com webpage. Um, obviously too, I take tens of personal calls a day, sometimes a hundred. And uh, that's what I do. Sometimes I feel like I have a communications job um, as much as, um, as much as anything else, but um, I'd love, we'd love to have conversations with folks about the future of the genetics business and how they can participate because it is not going to be easier it is going to get tougher. And so um being part of a good team makes sense. Um, great teams beat great individuals. And uh, we're trying to create the best team that we possibly can. Why Why do you say it's going to get tougher? Uh, because the downstream business that, that we, that we um, depend on is getting more coordinated. They're getting more value-based. Uh, they're asking for more things. And again, the people that write your check ultimately are going to make decisions for you, at least part of your decisions. And they're asking to make more of those decisions. And um, because of that, participation may not be, again, back to the old thing, may not be, hey, I've got the best bulls in the world. And um, you just look at the pitchers. They're obviously the best bulls in the world. Um, the the beef business long term is not going to respond to that as well as, as uh, where's their value? Where's their commitment? 
uh, where is there additional services available? And uh, that's what I, that's why I think it's going to be tough for, I mean, if, if you, and I, and I want to get into a conversation about, about business sizes and all, but if you don't depend on the beef business as your primary source of, of livelihood, you can do, you can do anything you want for as long as you want. Um, but for those that do, um, they're going, we have to, we're going to have to get better and smarter and faster. Um, otherwise, um, otherwise the competition is, is going to, and will catch up. And, um, we're not interested in that. We're interested in making sure that the independent producers we work with are successful and uh, that if they choose to, they can be in the beef genetics business for a very, very long time. All right. Well, Marty, is do you have any parting thoughts or anything you'd like to say before we wrap up? I, I think you did a good job. And I think I said almost, I think I, I said, I felt like I said the things I needed to say. Um, again, it's a, we're not a top down business. Um, the individual members make their own choices, uh, do their own things, uh, but we do we do provide a lot of support and a lot of uh, all, both uh, technology, consulting, um, support, personal support uh, for decision making. Because sometimes making those decisions is tough without some help saying, "Hey, look at here." When when those folks made those decisions, it was positive. And uh, you make those decisions and it'll be a positive result too. And uh, so even simple things like that are, are still important within our business. We, we get together once a year, um, the people involved in the business and do a, spend a lot of time on networking and on, you know, thought provoking kind of things to where um, if they're, again, if they're not thinking 10 or 20 years down the road, we try hard to, to make them, you know, to, to make them consider that in the process. I mean, all of, all of our owners, all of them are fully employed. Uh, they're, they, they're the feed truck driver, the CFO, the, the, uh, sale person, the customer service rep, the bull deliverer, um, the deacon in the church, uh, the football grandpa, whatever it is that they do, they're fully employed and, um, asking them to do more is difficult. Which is part of the reason why I said it's going to be difficult, more difficult moving forward. So, having someone that works with you to help provide those, those things that you either do not have time or expertise for um, is, is crucial and will be crucial moving forward. And again, that's, that's the base of our business. You can, you can use us for services that, um, that uh, you may, may not have time or, or um, the expertise to handle. And uh, we can, you know, we've got 10 employees now that's an incredibly talented group of folks and uh, whatever it is that you need from whether it's um, on the genetic side or on the customer service side, we can help access those things, access or outsource anything you need to do. So that, uh, again, so that you can stay in business. And if you're interested in the next generation, you can continue to do what you do well. All right, Marty. Well, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for time. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.